What kind of challenges do you feel like um, families face or parents face when their kids have mental illness, no matter what, whichever one it is? So I think I think one of them is this sense that you're the only one. Mm. I feel like parents as parents and as, I'm going to say as moms, I don't know about dads, right? but as moms, we when we have children, we connect by talking about our kids. We connect to other people by problem solving, sharing the joys, sharing the triumphs and the challenges. And I think sometimes when we as moms connect and one of us have a child with ADHD, for example, or with autism, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. other parents may not quite resonate and may not quite understand why things may be so difficult or persistent. And I think it brings a lot of shame. Welcome to Journey to Joy Live, a podcast for wellness, resilience, and joy, providing mental health awareness and breaking down the stigma of mental illness in the African-American community. I'm your host, Dr. N. Joy, and today I bring to you episode 43, Parenting Children with Mental Illness. And I have an awesome guest here today, Dr. Shivana Naidu. She's a child psychiatrist who I met at the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists annual meeting in New York last October. Great to have you. You want to introduce yourself and tell the guests more about yourself? Sure. So my name is Dr. Shivana Naidu. I'm the founder of Do Better MD, which is my private practice and consulting firm where I take care of a small group of patients and do good mental health the way that I want to, which includes sometimes medication, sometimes therapy, also nutritional psychiatry. I'm certified in that too. I also do consults with pediatricians where I help pediatricians learn how to better care for kids Mm -hmm. with mental health because we know there's a crisis and there's not enough of you and I, Dr. Mena, so they end up at the pediatrician's office. So I'm doing work with that. I also um, work right now at a partial hospital level of care, which is kind of an in between inpatient and outpatient, which we could talk about if you want to, called the Bradley Reach Program. Wow. And I'm a mom of two kids. I'm a singer-songwriter. And I guess most importantly, I'm a podcaster as well. So I uh, have a podcast called Thinking It Through with Dr. Naidu, child psychiatrist, where I really just aim to spread the word and information about options. Because if you don't know what's out there, you don't know what to ask for. So I really want my my patients, my parents to really advocate mm-hmm. for themselves and learn about all the options that are out, there are out there so they can find the best mental health care for them. Wow, that is fabulous. I have so many questions. Well, first of all, you said <laughs> nutri- nutritional psychiatry. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so, you know, there is another Dr. Naidu, not me, I'm not related to her. Her name is Dr. Uma Naidu. Nice. She wrote a book called This Is Your uh, Brain on Food. Uh-huh. And she is a, um, she's a chef. She has special credentialing as, as being a chef, uh-huh. as well as a psychiatrist. Uh-huh. And she has, you know, this has been going on for a while, but she's kind of crystallized nutritional psychiatry. There's a program at Harvard where you can just learn about how the food we eat is the medicine that can treat us. So she has an amazing book. I highly recommend reading it. Mm. But I went through something called the Integrative Psychiatry Institute, which has Mm. credentialing and all kinds of different alternative ways of treating mental health care. And they have a nutritional psychiatry program where you learn from nutritionists as well as psychiatrists as to how they use supplements and food to really help address mental health care concerns. Oh, that's exciting because I have a lot of patients asking me, well, what if I feed my kid this? Do I need to not do red dyes? What about gluten free? And, you know, I'm just not the expert in that. I like to tell them like, yeah, sure. If you stay away from some carbs, maybe that will lessen the ADHD, but I'm just not the expert. So that's what I think about when you say that. That sounds great. You know, what's interesting is that there are so many different options Mm -hmm. and each of us have been trained in different modalities And sometimes we just don't talk to each other, right? We don't hold hands and sing kumbaya. We're like, okay, you're the naturopath, you do you. I'm the allopath, I do me. I'm the chiropractor, I do me. I'm the therapist, I do me. And we can all work together because Mm -hmm. that one patient is going to all these different people (laughs) to find the right care for them, right? So we're, I think, in the in effort to secure our own you know, a stake in the game. I think that we don't reach across the aisle more. And just in medical school, I'm sure, you know, you remember on our board exams, right? They'd say, this is the vitamin you cannot use because Mm -hmm. if you use with that, you have a problem, right? All those things we had to memorize that I frankly don't remember, right? No, of course not. (laughs) It relates to psychiatry, I don't remember. (laughs) But that's how we're trained. We're trained to think that supplements are bad. Supplements are not mm. yeah, supplements are not evidence-based. Mm. And at the end of the day, if you do psychiatry, I'm sure with other fields as well, we know people are doing vitamins anyway. Everyone's mm-hmm. taking melatonin. Everyone's taking omega-3. Yep. Everyone's taking vitamin D. 
So everyone's doing it anyway. We allopaths, MDs, DOs, we have to get educated because if we don't know what our patients are taking and if they're scared Correct. to tell us because they think we're going to judge them, we won't know the oh. truth, right? Yeah, I honestly feel like I'm learning from them. And, you know, I definitely omega-3 fatty acids. I know those are evidence-based and I recommend those to everybody pretty much, but I'm going to get that book. What was the name of the book again? Uh, this is your brain on food. I think uh -huh. I, have to, I have to go. I don't have the the book is over there. <laughs> <I can get laughs> That's it. okay. <laughs> but I hope I have the 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 name right. <laughs> I think it's the brain on food. By Dr. No Ula problem. Yeah. That is cool. So you also mentioned you're a singer songwriter. Wow. Are you currently, or this is kind of pre doctor stuff? <laughs> it's, oh, I know how many things are pre doctor stuff, right? Our lives before doctor and kids and everything. Yeah. So I had a pre life, a life before kids, before medicine, where I, um, you know, I've always kind of been musically inclined. I went to the Juilliard school in high school, wow. middle school. I played the cello. Um, so I had this amazing experience where I lived in India for two years after I finished uh, college. And that really inspired me to learn to play the guitar and write music and express myself. So I had a stint of that where I dreamed of, you know, becoming Taylor Swift. And, you know, then med school called my name and I went in that direction. And uh, it's hard to do everything, right? So now that my kids are able to go to school and follow directions most of the time, not all the time, <laughs> I've kind of gotten back to myself and I, I'm, I have a guitar uh, teacher. My son's also taking guitar as well and just started to get back into that creative that is so myself. cool. That is so cool. That reminds me because I always wanted to go into dance in addition to being a doctor. I never quite did that. I did ba a ballet class somehow when I was in med school, but that was pretty much it. And that that sounds great that you're continuing to do that and bringing it back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think for, for mental health in particular, mm -hmm. music touches your soul, mm -hmm. right? And music brings out different emotions in people as well. So I think it is skill. really... You know, as a child psychiatrist and working with kids and with teenagers, they're so creative, right? They don't mm -hmm. have the filters we adult brains develop to kind of close ourselves off and hide ourselves. Right. So I really love using music as an opportunity to help understand kids, bring kids out of their shell and help them tap into what can heal them. Oh, that's really exciting. And then lastly, in your introduction, mentioning you have kids, you're a boy mom, right? I'm a boy mom. I what, am. I'm, what are I the ages? Be, they're, uh, they're eight and six. Oh, that's a great age. Everybody knows I have a one and a three-year-old and an almost 13-year-old. So I'm a boy oh. mom as well. Oh, well, that's a great age too. I, you know, I mean, I, I'm debating whether to go <laughs> for that girl, right? And uh, <laughs> which is no guarantee, right? They're, they're, Wait, you said you are or or some people might? Uh, no, I'm debating myself. Oh, debating. <laughs> one more time. But I don't know if I can handle three boys. That's that. Really oh, I was going to say you have a chance because at least you'd come out with three boys. And, and I can tell you three boys is just fine. But if I come out with four boys. Uh... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, then again, you have the six year old. So that that's a gap there. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're they're good. They're good together. They play well together. They fight together, you know, but they're good. That's really exciting. Well, uh, my audience knows on this podcast, I give my opinion, I give my anecdotes, I give based on my experience. And of course, I'm a psychiatrist, so I give my expert advice as well. So we're talking about parenting and parenting can be challenging in and of itself, whether your kid has a mental illness or a mental disorder or learning disorder or any types of challenges or medical conditions. Um, whether they have them or not, but we're talking about when they do. So Yes, it can be even more challenging to deal with a child, whether it's ADHD that they have, depression they face, uh, trauma, and then they have post-traumatic stress disorder, or you find that they are hallucinating or some type of psychosis, or as I said before, a learning disability. So what kind of challenges do you feel like families face or parents face when their kids have mental illness, no matter what? So I think I think one of them is this sense that you're the only one. Mm. I feel like parents as parents and as I'm going to say as moms, I don't know about dads, right? But as moms, we when we have children, we connect by talking about our kids. We connect to other people by problem solving, sharing the joys, sharing the triumphs and the challenges. And I think sometimes when we as moms connect and one of us have a child with ADHD for example or mm -hmm. with autism, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. other parents may not quite resonate and may not quite understand why things may be so difficult or persistent. And I think it brings a lot of shame to a yeah. lot of parents because they feel like 
they're made to feel like I'm to blame something. I, I'm doing mm. something wrong to have this happen for my kid. Yeah. So I can't share what's happening because no one gets it and no one is giving me the advice that I need. So I think there's this isolation that can often happen uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of parents that have kids with mental health concerns. And then the other thing is that if they have more than one kid and one kid does have a mental health care concern and the other does not, you have to parent a little differently, right? Even if yeah. you know you want to be as equal as you can, even if your kids without mental health disorders, I was going to say, yeah, they have different needs, right? Oh, yeah. But it becomes very evident uh, when you have multiple children that the attention you're giving to one may be different than you're giving to the others. And then there's some kind of sibling rivalry. You're not playing fair. You're giving them more attention. So I think there's a lot of dynamics between kind of targeting how to really help that child and meet their needs while other also meeting the needs of other people, other mm -hmm. children. And then also kind of feeling like you do have skills to help this child, right? Just because your other kids need certain things and you're trying mm -hmm. to have other resources to help this one, that you're capable. And I think that uh, those are two of the things that make it really challenging. Yeah. And it would seem that having more support groups would really be helpful so that those parents aren't feeling isolated. And I imagine there are parenting support groups, for, especially for parents of uh, kiddos with autism. There's Autism Speak. So mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of uh, campaigns and organizations out there for that, but maybe not enough for other mental disorders, or maybe they just don't know about it. So it's a matter of educating our parents about those. But that's real. The attention going on the kids who have the issues. I actually can't forget that my mom has mentioned to me more often than not, I can't remember you as a kid because I was just so focused on your brother and sister because yeah. they had some issues. My brother has high functioning autism. We were calling it borderline autism back then, but we didn't have a name for it. But now you would say it's high functioning autism or at some point you would have said um, Asperger's. But Anyhow, um, no offense. I don't I don't feel offended by it, but it is the the case that the attention goes on the child that's struggling the most. Yeah. And, you know, I will say my uh, so it's me, my sister and my brother mm -hmm. and my sister and I are a year and a half apart, 14 months apart. And my brother is eight years apart from me. And uh, my sister mm -hmm. has ADHD, but we didn't know it at the time, right? There's mm -hmm. stigma against all kinds of mm -hmm. mental health disorders. My mom, who's a teacher, wonderful parent. I love my mother, but didn't really want to believe, even as a teacher, that she had ADHD. So growing up, wow. um, you know, my dad passed away when we were 14. So my mom kind of raised us um, at, at that age. Yeah. Um, my brother and I were like, why are you spending so much time on our sister? What is going on? You love her mm. more, right? We had all these <laughs> frustrations, but she needed a different kind of attention. She needed a different kind of parenting than we did. And we as siblings didn't get that. It took us getting older and reflecting yeah. on it to be okay with it, but it, it caused a lot of inner emotional challenges growing up. Um, yeah. But it also helped you to become more aware that there are differences, right? That we are, mm -hmm. I mean, I've learned so much from my sister. She and I are very close in age. We think very, very differently about things. Um, but I've grown as a person because she and I are not not the same. Right, exactly. And, you know, we could talk more about that as far as, you know, like, why are you paying more attention to them? Because sometimes parents feel that they don't want to tell the other child what's going on with the first yeah. child or whichever child it right. is, because it's that child's personal business, or they don't know how to explain it to them. I mean, how do we talk to our kids or communicate about mental illness to them? Should we? Should we keep it a secret? It is. It's such a good question. I think it depends so much on yeah. the comfort level of the parents and that child the and child. their sense of privacy. Mm -hmm. It depends on our own awareness of our own issues versus our child's issues. What are mm -hmm. we projecting onto them? But, you know, for me, when I think about um, kids with mental health care and in mental health care, I think the generation below us, right, Gen Z, uh, they're very, very comfortable talking about their mental health. It's a whole different mm. world. They're, it's almost like a badge of courage to talk yeah. about mental health, yeah, that's true. to be on medication, to be in therapy. And I think it's very different for parents of Gen Z because they're not c familiar with this kind of open door about mm. what mental health care is. But I also think the flip side of that is that young people are raised now really attached to labels. Yeah. I am ADHD. I have ADHD. I am bipolar. Mm -hmm. I am depressed. That becomes a part of their identity. And I think there is a fine line between identifying with a challenge and becoming the challenge. Yes, right? exactly. Become what we, think, right? we visualize who we are and that becomes who we grow to be. And I think for 
kids and teens in general, there's some mm-hmm. kind of phase of development, right? We know as child psychiatrists where they're really forming who they are, their identity formation is happening. So I think it's really important as parents, we reflect back to them. I see you through the ADHD. I right. see you through the depression. I see, you know, you have some symptoms of anxiety, but anxiety, you know, does not have you. Yeah. So we have to kind of help our kids um, learn how to grow through these challenges and not see them as that is that mental health challenge. That is who you are. Identify. Yeah. It's their, I like, it's who they are. It's their identity, but it's what they have. It's a part of them, not everything that they are. That is definitely important. And some of my parents might say, and this is usually with an autism diagnosis, they might say, well, I haven't told them they have autism. I don't want them to feel ashamed. I don't want them to feel bad. I don't want to worsen their anxiety. Or if unfortunately they have a schizophrenic diagnosis, they may not say it. I mean, what are the pros and cons of telling the child what their diagnosis is? So that's a great question. I think it, again, depends on how, where the child is at, right? Because we know a 10-year-old child may be 10, but he might have the mind of a 12-year-old or Mm 13-year-old. And then there might be a 10-year-old child who has the mind of a four-year-old or six-year-old. It just depends on how that child is. I mean, my my kids, um, my younger son is very emotionally young. You know, he still has tantrums. He still has big emotions. He's six. But intellectually, he functions at or above my older son's age. Mm. So he can understand certain concepts, but then his reactions to it are very young. Yeah. So we have to meet that child where they're at. And I think when you come to this 12 age, 12 is a really critical age developmentally because they start to develop the sense of who am I and who is everybody else? Mm -hmm. Where do I fit in the world? That perspective taking is a part of that normal natural development. And that's where the start of who am I in this world of everybody else? How do I define who I am? Kind of comes to really unfold. Right. So I think a lot of kids can feel that they are different, but not put their finger on it. And sometimes mm. them saying, oh, I have autism? That makes sense. Hell, wow. yeah. Right? Like, I understand yeah. that. Why? I don't fit in. I have ADHD? Oh, that makes sense. So I think... Sometimes it can be valuable to use this label to explain to kids why things might be harder for them, why things might take more time, why things might be a little bit more difficult to them than their Mm -hmm. sibling or their Mm -hmm. best friend. So I think it just depends on where that child is at and if they're ready to come to terms with that um, label. Mm -hmm. And again, what does the label mean? And that you are beyond that label. The label does not define you. It's a part of who you are, but it's not all. Yeah, exactly. And there's many books out there for how to explain ADHD to a child, how to explain autism. There's many, many books out there. And also, if you need help with explaining it to your child and have questions, you can do it with the mental health provider. The psychiatrist or therapist can help you explain it. So there's there's help the, out there. And with the pediatrician. I always want us to go back to our pediatrician That's because true. they yeah. cover everything, right? right? Like they're not just mental health. They are also anticipatory development, anticipatory Mm -hmm. guidance. They know how to prepare, anticipate normal developmental changes versus maybe not so normal changes. So if you're having a hard time, parent, talking about diagnosis with your kid, you can always bring them to the pediatrician and say, hey, um, you can prime the pediatrician and say, hey, they got a diagnosis of ADHD. I don't really know how to talk to them about it. Can you help me navigate that that discussion? Yeah. And then- the pediatrician can model for you how to speak about it or start planting the seeds for discussing what are the changes that you anticipate in the ADHD brain? How does it affect you in your life? Um, And sometimes even teachers as well can be really helpful Mm -hmm. because we as parents like to explain things and say things to our kids and it doesn't seem to get into our head, their head, right? Sometimes they need different adults, different people to share that messaging so that it gets in. So I think that whatever person could be your pastor, right? It could be anyone that you trust that can help kind of be that bridge to, again, help that child understand how they are different and the same and still loved and still valuable and still a good person despite having these challenges. Yes. Yes. That's really good. I mean, the pediatricians are the first line of defense, so it's really good to utilize our pediatricians. So taking a step back, because we're actually talking about once they've already had the label or been diagnosed and they're already in treatment, taking a step back, maybe they haven't been diagnosed with anything, but there may be some issues, uh, struggling in school or something going on where the parent might be wondering, hmm, is my child struggling with a mental illness? So what are some of the signs that someone's child might be struggling with a mental illness or with their mental health? 
So I think some signs are how is that child affected in their life and in the family life? Yeah. So kids are really good observers of the world, but not very good interpreters. So they can see changes and feel changes, but they may not know how come that's happening. So this might come about as your kid has a really hard time fitting in and finding friends. Okay. That's kind of normal, right? It's normal for it to be hard to navigate the world of making friends, but some kids are so impaired that they don't have any friends, right? Or they start to feel bad about themselves because they don't make friends. So how impairing is this normal expected change and challenge? Can your child meet the challenge? Can they make one or two friends? Or are they really sitting by themselves in the cafeteria and crying into their bag lunch because they don't have any friends? That might be, okay, maybe this is a sign that there's some anxiety Mm -hmm. or some sadness or some Mm -hmm. social awkwardness that's happening. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a sign that this is not a good school for this kid and it's not a good fit for them, right? So maybe it's not the kid that has a challenge, but the school meeting that child's needs. So, you know, I would think about what are normal expected changes in children normal transitions, and how does that child meet that challenge? Another environment to look at besides school, and of course, you know, are they performing well academically? Are they not? Are they able to sit still, raise their hand? And so the teachers are always a very good person to talk to to say, hey, I mean, even with my my younger son, as I said, he he feels big feelings. And I asked the teacher, you know, I'm a child psychiatrist. She knows I'm a child psychiatrist, but she's an experienced first grade teacher, right? She's taught hundreds of kids. so I, you know, I asked her, like, what are your thoughts about my son? Do you feel like this is atypical? Um, and, you know, he's a December baby. So I know he's young in general. He's a younger kid. She gave me some perspective on whether I should be concerned or not, whether I should put him in counseling or not. I've thought about mm, putting him in counseling either, okay. actually, to, to kind of teach him skills. Because, again, he's not listening to <laughs> this. A lot of emotion. I, <laughs> I can try to teach him. But, you know, parents are different than, uh, than counselors and, and teachers. Yeah. But then the other thought is home. Again, how dysfunctional impairing are these issues at home? Is your child so anxious that they don't come out of their room? Are they participating in family activities? Are Do you see a change in how they typically are with mm-hmm. you versus your spouse versus with, with your other siblings? Are they talking about the same thing? Are they seeming to have just really different emotions that stick? Mm-hmm. So I I advise using this acronym for parents who are kind of figuring out, is this a problem or not? Mm-hmm. The acronym is FIND, F-I-N-D. Okay. I want you to find the change. Nice. So let's say you notice a change in your child. You want to note, okay, F, what is the frequency of this change? Gotcha. Let's say it is oversleeping, excessive sleeping. And you don't know what that is. Are they just staying up too late? Are they depressed? Mm -hmm. Are they um, stressing out at school? Okay. So you find the frequency, how often it happens that this kid sleeps in late. I is intensity. Mm. How strong is this problem? Are they sleeping in late by like an hour? Are they sleeping in so late they're going into 3 p.m. on the weekends? Right, right. Are they sleeping so late that they can't go to sleep at all at night because they slept through the whole day? How intense, how severe is that issue? N is number. So how, what is the number cluster of when it occurs? Do you find that your kid's sleeping in for like Sunday, Monday, um, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday on the weekends? Yeah. Is it just once a month it's happening? Is it happening just in the winter time? You know, and the rest of the year, they're totally fine. But the winter time, Christmas, Thanksgiving time, you find that they're really sleeping in super late. So what is the number? And then D is what we use for all um, mental health diagnoses and concerns, which is dysfunction. Ah, what is the level of, of impairment and dysfunction that that's happening for your kid? Are they sleeping in so late they miss the bus? Are they sleeping in so late they miss tests? Are they sleeping in so late they don't hang out with their friends? Or are, are you, just, you just have to arouse them a little bit and they're jumping up out of bed and, and going to school? So find frequency, intensity, number of those episodes, and duration. That's something you can use. That's an acronym you can use as a parent to really assess, okay, if I see a change and I'm not sure if this is a problem or Mm -hmm. not, if any of those are hit, and especially if the last one dysfunction is hit, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you got to bring it to your pediatrician. You start there. Say, hey, this is what I found. (laughs) I found these changes. found it. Pediatrician, what do you think? Do you think this is an issue or not? And then they can go ahead and assess further with their scared for anxiety or their PHQ-9 for depression or you know, Vanderbilt for ADHD or whatever assessment they have, whatever tools they're using to really s- dig a little bit deeper. 
Awesome. That's very good. I'm going to start using that fine F-I-N-D frequency, intensity, number, and dysfunction. That's And that's really easy for people to remember. And you already answered the next question. I was going to say, once you find the change, what do you do next? <laughs> How can you support your kiddo and get them to professional help? At the very least, you go to the pediatrician. Every parent's child should have a pediatrician. Go to the pediatrician. And that's how you can get resources for mental health. Is there anything else to add to that if uh, someone was looking for a psychiatrist and how to do go about doing that? So if they're looking for a psychiatrist or a counselor and you, you've gone to the pediatrician, you can't find a psychiatrist that way, I would also look into schools. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a whole other question about whether you want your school to know or not. But if you have found a challenge that mm -hmm. is troubling your kid's academic performance, I think that it is important to consider whether or not to tell the school. Because it could be in your child's best interest to give the school counselor or the yeah. assistant principal or their teacher a heads up and say, yeah. hey, we're working on this. We're not sure what's happening. We need to explore. Can you give them some grace with this project? Can you help them with this particular issue? Because you as the parent, you have to advocate for your kid until they're able to advocate for themselves, right? We try to get our kids to be independent and advocate, but sometimes we have to do it for them, especially if your kid is shy or, or disorganized yeah. <laughs> or really struggling uh, in other ways. So bringing it up to the school counselor, I think is a good option. And you could also just say, Hey, um, I have a kid who may need mental health help, or I know of somebody. Do you know of someone in this area that can be helpful? So that's another thing you could do. Um, and also I say, you know, everyone should have an insurance card, hopefully, even if you have Medicaid, you should have a yeah. card. On the back of that, there's a number. And mm -hmm. that number, which is very frustrating, all those toll-free numbers, like you're on the phone forever. Yeah. But they should be able to give you three people in your catchment area that take your insurance that have openings. Because every psychiatrist that takes insurance or therapist that takes insurance, they have to be paneled. Right. So the insurance company holds the names of us, right, who are taking insurance, <laughs> and they will dole that out if you ask them. And sometimes they give you the provider's cell phone number. <laughs> 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 Maybe that's not your fault. <laughs> Maybe I need to make sure my cell phone number's not on there. But yeah, yeah, right. that's good. <laughs> yeah, so I would do I would do that. It's it, you will be frustrated on the phone. You totally will. Yeah. Um, but I think those are good ways to kind of get ahead of the game and set something up. And I know um, oftentimes people don't want to see a psychiatrist. They want to see a counselor or a therapist. It sounds less frightening or worrisome. And I think that you can start anywhere you're comfortable, anywhere yeah. you get in, right? Like if it's a counselor, if it's a therapist, if it's a psychiatrist, if it's a marriage family therapist, you know, whoever it is you can get into. But the pediatrician is always a good start. School counselor is always a good start. The back of your insurance card, always a good start. Great. I think you covered all the bases there, Dr. Naidu. Thank you so much. So I want to be very clear that the blame isn't on parents and, you know, as far as what's going on with your child. Um, however, sometimes there could be some type of family dynamics that might be, uh, um, trying to use my words safely, that, that that may not be helpful or conducive to their mental illness um, or that supports the child's state or what's going on. So what are some family dynamics that you feel might play in lack of support and supporting that child? So I think that we live in a really, I'm, I'm sure every parent has said this throughout like eons and eons, but we live in a really tough generation. Right? Yeah. Parents are really, really stressed. Mm -hmm. Parents are really pulled in many, many different directions. Yeah. Several families have multiple children. Yeah. Several families, they have multiple jobs. And it's really challenging to be focused on raising kids. Yeah. And I think now that more women are in the work field, it's mm -hmm. more uh, kind of dedicated uh, parents take care of their kids. I mean, even myself, like we had a nanny for a very long time because I was working yeah. and my, I mean, my husband works and I work, but I was working uh -huh. out of the home and it was really hard. I needed to help to like really be there with, with my children. So I think that, um, some of the dynamics that can affect our ability to parent and respond to our kids is how distracted we are. And I think that that is, a, a, again, a, a the consequence of how challenging our world is mm -hmm. and how distracted we are making ourselves. I say that because we are choosing to be distracted too, right? There are That's demands, true. but I am choosing to go on my phone and check things out on social media or on Goodness, shopping network or whatever, right? Like that's my choice. Yeah. So I think that the first thing we need to do as parents to really be responsive 
is be mindful of our own inner dynamic. So I'll give an example. I pick my kids up from school. I, I work very early in the morning. I don't drop them to school, but I pick them up from school. I partially do that so that I have time with my kids when they come home and they're fresh from school and they're mm-hmm. receptive. I'm looking for a window of receptivity for them to oh. engage with me and me to engage with them, right? right? And when they're in the car, they can't go anywhere. They don't have their tablet. <laughs> right. They're not distracted. And they are fresh from school uh, on their way home. They're excited. They're ready to talk. That's so when I'm great. in the car, I'm listening, listening, listening to everything they're saying, and I'm responding. Unless I have a podcast on, right? Like if I have a podcast on, <laughs> I am distracted. Yes. Right? I'm listening to the podcast. I'm listening to the kids. And honestly, I, I don't like driving. My husband loves driving, but I hate driving. I find it very frustrating and taxing. So I'm focusing on the road. So if I put a podcast on and I pick up my kids, I'm setting myself up to close mm. the window of receptivity. Setting yourself up. Yes. Wow. My inner dynamic is not conduct conducive to talking yeah. to my kids. So I need to stop the podcast. Duh, yeah. right? Rocket science here. But, <laughs> but sometimes I get into it and I don't want to stop it, right? <laughs> exactly. So I, what I, have mean? To, I have to parent myself. I have to parent myself. So a tip that I recommend for parents comes in part from my concept of, um, you know, you, you travel on the plane, right? You go, to, mm-hmm. you have, do you have TSA pre-check? No, but I need to. <laughs> you need to. You need to get TSA pre-check or a clear, right? Because it makes everything go much smoother. Anyway, yeah. there's TSA pre-check, which maybe some of you guys know, right? You get your pre-clearance. So you don't have to wait on the very, very, very long line to go through. Well, we have the stroller. As long as we have the kids in the stroller, oh. we go right through the line. At least some airports do that. We miss out on that when the kids grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Put the six-year-old in the stroller. <laughs> I know, right? So, um, so the concept that I, I have is from this and then this other book uh, by Samuel Shem. I don't know if you mm-hmm. read God of Small, mm-hmm. God, uh, The House of God. The House of no, God. I heard of it for sure. Oh, very. So every medical professional has maybe heard of this book, um, The House of God, which is a parody of medical training. And in this book, which is written actually by a psychiatrist, he became a psychiatrist and wrote a book called okay. Mount Misery, which is about psychiatry training. Uh-huh. In the book about medical training, one of the steps of being a good doctor is when there's a cardiac arrest, you take your own pulse first. Yeah. The doctor takes his own pulse first. So this idea is called oh. a parent pre-check. Parents, I want you to take an emotional read on your emotional pulse. Your parent pre-check is before you engage with your kid, where are you in your scale of receptivity? Where are you on your emotional scale? That's nice. How distracted are you? How emotional, angry, anxious are you? Because mm. it's kind of goes back to SUDS, right? Subjective units of distress, where we ask yeah. people, you know, where are you on a scale of one to 10 mm-hmm. um, in terms of your emotions? So the pre check is, you know, if you are 10 is like high emotion, high distracted, highly stressed, you can't engage with your kid then, right? You can't be able to respond to them if you're in a headspace where you're, you're at the, you know, exactly. your cup is overflowing. Yeah. So I say, if you're three and below on your on your scale of pre-check, yeah. three and below, you're good to go. You can talk to your kid. But if you're four or more, mm-hmm. you have to reduce the score. You can't be up four, five, six, seven, stressed out, anxious, angry, distracted, and then go talk to your kid. Because you know your kid's going to do all sorts of things to push your buttons up, to push up that. Right. Temperature. And it'll trigger them to act a certain way if you're acting that exactly. way. Yeah. Right. So if we can remain in a good headspace less likely to be triggered. We will be less triggered by our kids and less likely to trigger our kids because it's a dynamic then between us and our child, right? We are going back and forth together with them. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that more so than the, and of course there are lots of family dynamics between other members, right? If there are mental health challenges within that family, financial struggles, Mm -hmm. impending moves, impending transitions, you know, grandma just moved in and that's stressing out the family. There are many things that can really affect um, children in terms of family dynamic. But I think more importantly than that, because we have all kinds of people in this world, many Mm -hmm. people can handle stress Mm -hmm. in their own way. Despite what's going on around here in our family, if if you can manage that stress and keep your parent pre-check down below three, you can do a good job interacting with your kid. That goes back to your own self-care, making sure you get it, managing your own stress, making sure you have your own therapist or counseling. If you have your own mental illness, 
Um, but weaning out the distractions, are, that's definitely important. Because as you were talking, I was thinking about how it's usually if I'm trying to read something, if I choose to read a work email while I'm with the kids, that's not their fault. But that's when I get more stressed because I'm just like, and then I found an email that's making me stress because it's a work email and it's about this thing that I need to do. So then he's stressing me out, poor kid, because I decided to read that email. It's like, okay, why don't I close my phone and deal with that later and be receptive to my child right now in this moment? So that's some good stuff right there. But it's hard, right? Because we have yeah. so many demands, right? So you're checking the email because you want to be ahead of the game the next yeah. time you have to go into work, right? Exactly. And so it's 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 really hard. <laughs> and I think that, you know, I, I think there's a current TikTok or YouTube or something. There's some current um, trend about the most um, helpful times to be efficient with connecting to your children. Okay. One of that is that window of time when they first get up. Oh. One is when they come home from school. Okay. And then the last is right before bed. Yeah. Those are the three windows where kids are potentially more open to connecting with you. Mm. And the thought is that if you can spend five, 10 minutes each of those windows, then you are you can shut off your, you know, your distractions for those 30 minutes and just try to connect with them, you know? And psychologists always say the best way to connect with your kid is to have floor time, to play with them, to just mm -hmm. give them that five minutes of your undevoted attention which sounds so simple, but it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Because yeah. even if you have no phone and you have no um, email, your head still has to be focused on that. Oh child, my right? goodness. So I think, yeah. I think that goes back to, to you and your message of journey to joy. How do we let ourselves enjoy our children? How do we let ourselves, let them let the joy they're naturally giving come into us? Because right. we block it. Find that kid it. at heart. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I, I mean, my, my younger son is, is still six. He is very adorable. He has lots to say. And there are times where I'm like, oh my God, he's talking so much. I can't. Right. But he's just sharing his love and joy. Yeah, with he's talking. Because in a minute, he won't be talking to you. He'll be worried exactly. about going on, spending time with his friend. <laughs> exactly. Right. So how can I remain open to receiving that joy and love from them? And that will feed my attention, right? If I see them as, okay, they're just shining their love on me. Let me, let me be like a flower and soak up exactly. that sun. Exactly then that will help me be more attentive. And I, I feel like this sounds very loosey-goosey and floofy, but I think <laughs> that this is where like parenting kids with mental health can be so challenging because they're not shining their sun on us, right? <laughs> they're spewing insults at us. They are throwing their fire yeah. at us because they're yeah. not feeling good on the inside, right? I call these kids cactus kids. They're like these beautiful mm. roses that have transformed into cactuses, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm living in Arizona, right? So cactus is the theme. They have prickles coming out because they don't feel good on the inside. Yeah. So when you as a parent go to hug them, you get you get bruised. You get Yeah, pricked. exactly. Oh, it's hard to see that love on the inside shining through when those kids develop these prickles. So I think it's still there. We just have to push ourselves to see a little bit more through that thick skin. Right. So how can we manage our own care? Because you did mention if your if your level of distress is a four and above, you need to bring that down to three and below. How do we do that? So how do we do that in order to be receptive? And how do we do that in order to deal with these prickly cactus kids? <laughs> yeah. So everyone's different, right? Like some yeah. I know for me, I need I need a lot of alone time, right? Like I find that uh, I need to have some time by myself if mm -hmm. I get up in the morning and I have done a little bit of meditation and I have kind of brought myself to center and I have my moment of gratitude where I kind of fill my my physical space with all sorts of positive hey. things because I'm I'm blessed. I'm a fortunate person, right? If I remind hey. myself of that to start my day, Yeah, that helps me keep things down, right? And I know, as I said on this podcast just now, if I'm distracted listening to things I want to listen to, like this will also happen with PBS News, right? I like to watch PBS News. So when I watch the news and the kids come in, I have to pause it because if I'm watching, I can't listen to them. So I know those are my own triggers for bringing things up the temperature scale. So I, I urge you, listener, what are those things for you? Right? Yeah. Think about the times you've lost your tongue. Think about the times you've felt the pressure and temperature raise in your temples, right? The throbbing in your temples as a parent. What are those things that have happened? Are they thing you, things you can control or not control? And for some people, it's connecting to their spouse. And that feeds, fills their cup. Others, it's tapping out and saying, spouse, it's your turn. Go, right? And for those of us who don't have spouses, it might be just taking the time to close things off that need to be closed off and mm -hmm. give yourself 
that yeah. two minute cup of tea, right? Like I'm going to make a cup of tea. I'm hey. going to drink my cup of tea and chill before I engage. So different things work for different people. And I know that there have been some, some thoughts that, you know, bubble baths are not going to help and a cup of tea won't help. And it may not for other people, but it might for you, right? Maybe it's going on a nice walk where you vent to your mom. Maybe you just need to get it out or vent to a, 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 another friend and say, this is how difficult things Getting are. Once you get it out, you're able to come back to yep. center and, and talk. Everyone has different ways of coping. And I think it's kind of the journey to process what works for us, right? Everyone's different. And I think that always we have access to our breath, to our eyes, and to our mouth, right? And sometimes tapping into our breath, shutting our mouth, mm -hmm. things, love it. And closing our eyes to what we see or opening our eyes and just focusing on the love one thing it. that matters can help. Right. We always have access to that. So I found sometimes with my younger son, who sometimes because he talks a lot, mm -hmm. um, will get me going. <laughs> if I focus on the sound of his voice, that doesn't help me. But if I look into his eyes, oh. that helps. Ah. Because I'm like, this is my child, right? I see his eyes, right? I see his enthusiasm. So I'm going to close my mouth. I'm not going to tell him I'm annoyed. I'm going to just be receptive. Right. I see Don't him, tell him. And that grounds me, right? So it is what what works for you. That's really good as far as that last comment. I'm not going to tell him I'm annoyed because, I mean, I think back, how would I feel if my mom said she was annoyed by me or angered by me? It would just stress me out, make me feel really sad. So if we can hold our tongue and take that deep breath and not say what we're thinking, if we're thinking it, because I said last week on my podcast, Parenting Challenges, kids can get annoying. We all know that, yeah. but they don't need to be told that they're annoying or that there are brats or that they're this and that and the other. So that's really important. And as a child psychiatrist, I will share with parents, we never know what comments we say will make or break our child. Yeah. We never know. Yeah. And so often when it comes, you know, one of my, my platforms and passions is suicide prevention in youth. So often when I see kids, because I see high-risk kids, kids that have attempted suicide or thinking of suicide, um, they come in because of something that their parents said. Mm -hmm. Something their That's friend true. said. What, it's really what their parent or friend said yeah. that really got stuck inside of them. Oh, that's my so parents true. said they didn't want to talk to me. My parent, you know, talked to me and then went to work. How could yeah. they go to work? Right? Like obviously your parent has to go to work, but they're inter again, they're good ob observers but not very good interpreters, right? So they can observe and hear what you said, but then they interpret it a totally different way you may not have even meant. And that is taken as this personal egotistical injury that mm -hmm. cuts so deep that they don't want to live. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, mm. I'm not trying to scare any parent, right? Like we have to be mindful of what we, we say and what we do. But I think it is a valuable thing sometimes to know when not to speak. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, yes, we have to share our emotions, but there's also a time to share our emotions. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you are dealing with a cactus kid or a kid with mental health care concerns, it's it's triply important to be mindful of when and how we say things. Mm -hmm. It's a It's different than raising another kid who has a bit more resilience whose skin is um whose skin is not as bruised as easily. So I think it's a really important point you just said there, Dr. That's Mayer. really, really good information. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadi. I feel like we talked about a lot. We talked about parenting, self-care. How can we get ourselves together? Because I mean, you got to take care of yourself in order to be a better parent, in order to raise these kids as best as you can. And just thinking about what we have control over and what we don't, because we literally cannot control these kids either. So accepting that. So this has been a great talk. Is there any last words that you had that you want to tell any listeners? You know, I always find this the hardest. I right? know. <laughs> the last words. Or you could talk about your journey to joy. <laughs> That's usually oh, a question that I ask. Joy. <laughs> oh man, my journey to joy. You know, I thought you were going to ask this too. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm prepared for this. I will just say, I think, I think I'm relearning after the trauma <laughs> of medical training and residency and honestly parenting too. Parenting is not an easy road. I think I am learning to connect back to myself and the Shivana that's behind Dr. Naidu. And some of that is the singer songwriting. Some of that is Ooh, yeah. you know filling my heart with with joy that comes from my kids and comfort of myself, right? Like I can fill my own cup. I guess that's what I'm working on in terms of journey to joy. And I think for oh, parents, nice. I would urge you to, what can you do? to fill your own cup. Because if you can fill your own cup as a parent, you can parent any kid. 
but you have to be able to fill yeah. your own cup because you can't expect your spouse to do it. And Correct. you can't expect your kid to do it. Anybody? And you can't expect any therapist to do it, right? We have to do it for ourselves. We become our self-sustaining cup of tea. <laughs> oh, so that's what fabulous. is it that you can put in here to fill yourself up? Exactly. Because if nobody else is going to do it, you got to at least do it for yourself. And then you also mentioned resilience, which is key. Let's build up our children. If they're going through whatever they're going through, bullying, whatnot, that's going to end up happening regardless. But the way they respond to that stress or to that bullying or to that challenge can change based on how they perceive it. So resilience, resilience, resilience. So I'm glad you mentioned there's that a, earlier. There's a great book called Thrivers by Michelle mm. Borba. She's mm -hmm. an education, uh, she's an, um, a doctor of education. Her book is about how to develop thriving, resilient kids. Oh, wow. If you look at their interest in resilience. Thrivers, there are, right. Yeah, there are seven personality traits that have skills that can be built. So it's another book to pick up. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks for that tidbit. And where can we find you, Dr. Naidu? Oh, yes. Where can you find me? Okay. So uh, my website, uh, Do Better MD. Um, is where you can find me. My podcast is on there, information about my private practice and my consults and my hope to help parents be more empowered to prevent suicide, all on there. And my podcast is called Thinking It Through with Dr. Naidu, child psychiatrist. So you can find me on any platform there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Naidu. I really appreciate you. Thank you. So good to talk to you. Mm -hmm.